honor to uh, introduce our speaker, Reza Zagami, whom I consider a role model for our second generation Iranians living outside of Iran. He has such a passion and interest in Iranian heritage and history, and at his still young age, he has accomplished so much. Before introducing Reza, I would like to say a few words about his family background. Reza comes from a very distinguished Iranian family. His father, Mehdi Zagwami, a distinguished engineer scientist, and I were both together teaching at Ayyamif University. Now it's called Sharif University. Mehdi left Iran with his family in 1979 and moved to the United States. Since then he has been working in the field of engineering and structural design. He has published several books, has written over 100 papers. He is the recipient of some important awards in the United States for his work. Reza is following his family tradition of excellence in his chosen field. Reza Zarbani grew up in uh, Boston. His immersion in the ancient history of Iran started early. At the age of 13, he began studying old Persian cuneiform at the urging of Professor Richard Fry, the founder of Center for uh, Middle Eastern Studies at Harvard University. He attended Columbia University, pursuing a double major in history and biology, studying Persian literature and language, and graduating with an honor in 19, sorry, in 2000. Three years later, he received a JD degree from Harvard University Law School, where his writing included Comparison of ancient Near Eastern legal, legal systems. He currently practices law in an international law, law firm. He is the author of Discovering Sages, a detailed biography of Sages the Great, and recently he has been collaborating on a Persian history project with the Harvard University Center for Hellenic Studies. Also, Wiley Blackwell has recently asked him to make a contribution to a forthcoming volume on leadership in ancient world. By the way, Wiley is a prestigious publisher in the United States, and nine Wiley authors have been among the 2014 Nobel Prize winners. Perhaps Reza could be the next one. Ladies and gentlemen, Reza Zagami. Thank you very much for that very warm and kind introduction. Uh, I obviously have big shoes to follow based on that. Uh, <laughs> but it is an honor, it's truly an honor to be here at the Iran Heritage Foundation organization that has done so much to really promote and celebrate the glories of Iranian culture, as well as to raise awareness about important issues that are or should be of interest to all of Iranians today. I am here to talk about Cyrus the Great, who is the subject of my recently published book, Discovering Cyrus, the Persian Conqueror, and Stride of the Ancient World. This book was released in the United States in November of 2013, and in the United Kingdom a few months later. This book fits in the genre of historical biography, and I say that as a caveat or for the edification of any academics in attendance here. My purpose in writing this book was not to present a dry clinical analysis 
of the source material pertaining to Cyrus, but to bring this very important historical personage to life, to the maximum extent possible, to delve into detail and explore the richness and the detail and vivid imagery of that time, to present Cyrus as a three-dimensional character, as they say, with words and all. This was not the easiest undertaking, mainly because of the nature of the sources. The ancient Iranians did not preserve their history in a reliable format that has survived to the present. Much of what we have that falls in the category of narrative uh, accounts of Cyrus's life are in the form of quasi-legend, and they've been preserved in the writings of the Greek and the Latin authors. What I found myself having to do throughout the course of writing this book was to separate the fact from the fiction. And I did this by triangulating the accounts of the Greek and Latin authors against the very fragmentary, but on the whole, more reliable cuneiform records, as well as the archaeological and linguistic data. It was a very time-consuming task. It took me about 12 years to write this book, which admittedly I did part-time while working in a law firm. But it was one that I felt was necessary, because this sort of book, one that really has Cyrus as the focal point, and goes into detail, it really had not been done, at least in the English language. And why do I say it was worthwhile? It's because Cyrus was a very important person. If I had to sum up his legacy in the span of a few bullet points, I would say that first and foremost, Cyrus was the founder of the Achaemenid Persian Empire. Achaemenid is the name given to this state because it was the name also of the dynasty of Persian kings to which Cyrus belonged, and I actually do adhere to the traditional notion, which has been contested recently, that Cyrus was an Achaemenid. Cyrus founded this state, which was the largest in the then history of the world. And you have to, to appreciate what he did, you have to consider that the Persian Empire was five to six times larger than the greatest state to precede it. And Cyrus founded it in the very short span of 11 years, and he conquered it virtually from scratch. You see in this map the territories that Cyrus himself conquered are shaded in purple. And so we see that in his lifetime, this empire spanned from the Aegean Sea in the west to the frontiers of India in the east, from the Jaxartes or Sir Daria River in the northeast to the frontiers of Egypt. The empire was expanded subsequently during the reigns of Cyrus's successors. His son and heir, Cambyses II, added Egypt and other territories in North Africa to the Persian Empire. And under Darius I, the man who would later become Cyrus's son-in-law, the areas in Western India, Central Asia, the Caucasus, and even Southeastern Europe were added to the Persian Empire. Now, there have been many conquerors in history. Alexander the Great is another one who comes to mind. But Cyrus's empire, unlike that of Alexander, was able to survive. Obviously, this had to do in part to the genius of his illustrious successor, Darius, who in some ways refounded the empire. But it also goes back to one of the core principles of Cyrus's rule, which insofar as we can tell from the available sources, was that he ruled based on tolerance and acceptance of local customs. And so what this meant, and it has been characterized as follows, that the Persian kings were able to maintain the far-flung frontiers of their empire with a relatively modest exertion of force. They did not have to fight as hard as other empire masters to maintain their dominion, which is all the more impressive given what I have said, which is that the Persian Empire was five or six times larger than the greatest state to proceed. Finally, what Cyrus did, and I don't think he receives nearly enough credit for this, is that Cyrus appears to have been very dedicated to safeguarding the agricultural settlements. These are really the lifelines of civilization, if you would, in northern and eastern Iran from the forays of marauding steppe tribes from Central Asia. And as we will see, he would ultimately sacrifice his life to this end. Now, my book is a little bit more than just the history of Cyrus. It's a period piece, if you would. And so we explore also the origins of the Iranian people. And so we should begin by talking about the Iranians. Who were they? Where did they come from? Well, the Iranians were an Indo-European people. This is not a denomination of race, but of language. And what it means is that the Iranians spoke languages and dialects that were in antiquity very closely related to Sanskrit in the East, but also more distantly related to Greek and to Latin. 
Where they came from is not entirely clear, but it would appear that they arrived in the Iranian plateau. That would be the geographical formation, the frontiers of which are more or less uh, commensurate with those of the present day nation of Iran from Central Asia, and that this migration occurred anywhere between, say, a few centuries to maybe a thousand years before Cyrus's lifetime. The Iranians, the early Iranians, were divided into numerous tribes and nations, but the two most important for our purposes were the Medes and the Persians. The Medes settled in the northwestern quadrant of the Iranian plateau. Their base of power was the ancient city of Ekbatana, which is present-day Hamadan. The Persians settled further to the south, in the area of Fars, and Fars is of course just the Arabicized form of ancient Parsi, which means Persian. What were the early Iranians famous for? Well, if we go by the testimonies of their neighbors, they were first and foremost excellent horsemen and horse breeders, and we see that in this pair of images over here. The image on top is a line drawing of the cylinder seal of a certain Kurash, son of Tyspes of Anshan. This is most likely Cyrus I, the grandfather of our Cyrus, who is actually Cyrus II in the Achaemenid pedigree. And it shows him here wearing the typical Iranian riding costume, which consists of a forward-pointed hood similar to a Santa Claus outfit, and a tight hood with fitting riding outfit, and he's throwing spears at his enemies, who are most likely Elamites. Now, this artifact really encapsulated some of the dynamics that were going on in early Iran. On the one hand, the Persians have invaded and they may be slaying the Elamites. On the other hand, the inscription on the seal itself is in the Elamite language, and it refers to Persia not by its Indo-European name or Iranian name, but as Anshan, which is the Elamite name for that region that the Persian tribes occupied in southwestern Iran. And so this kind of encapsulates, as I said, the complex dynamics that were going on between the Iranians who had recently settled in the Iranian plateau and the substrate population. And the Persians would learn much from the Elamites, particularly in the realm of material culture, as the Elamite civilization was quite advanced. The image below shows Median tribute bearers bringing gifts of war horses to the Assyrian Empire, Emperor Sargon II. Now, the Assyrian Empire was very important and influential in the early history of Iran, and in truth, one can't really tell the story of Cyrus or appreciate what he did without first taking a look at this empire. The Assyrian Empire was very well run, it had a first-rate bureaucracy, an excellent military that was very well organized and outfitted in part by the state itself, and a strong ideology of kingship. And the Persian emperors would borrow some of these traditions from the Assyrians. However, the Assyrian imperial ethos was one predicated on terror. The Assyrian kings attempted to cow their enemies and their subjects into submission. And so what we see in the monumental art and architecture of the Assyrian period that we do not see, as far as we know, in the monumental art or architecture of the Achaemenid period are scenes of war and conquest. And you see episodes of that here in these two images. The image on the left, your left, shows Assyrian soldiers wearing their typical iron helmets besieging the city. There is a siege engine over here. It's really up, and we're down the laser corner. There's a siege engine that is a uh, covered battering ram on a set of wheels that has been, uh, uh, that some scholars believe is the inspiration for the Trojan Wars. But you see in the background that the Assyrians have taken their enemies, stripped them naked, and impaled them on stakes. The image to the right shows Assyri the Assyrians engaging in a practice that some scholars have lightheartedly referred to as god mapping. The ancient Near Easterners attributed magical qualities to the images and idols of their gods. And so the Assyrians, in order to keep their subjects in line, would confiscate these idols and hold them hostage. And you see here Assyrian soldiers emptying a shrine of its idols. Now, the Assyrians did not just take away the statues and images of divinities in the foreign lands, but they would also engage in a practice called population deportation. What this means is that the Assyrians, when they would conquer a province, would transplant a large segment of the population to another region of their empire, and that they would replace that segment with peoples taken from other provinces. There were different motivations for why they did this, but one of them was that the Assyrians were concerned to efface and wipe out the national identity of their subjects by shuffling them around. 
And they did this because they wanted to safeguard against a resistance of a national character. Now, the Assyrian Empire, on account of its brutal methods, was not very popular among the subject nations. And it is said that no sooner would the Assyrians conquer a province than that those people, once the Assyrian armies moved out, would rise up in rebellion. As a result, the Assyrian Empire was in a state of constant warfare. It has been estimated, based on the records, that during the 120-year period that marked the heyday of Assyrian power, from the reign of Tiglath Pilesar III in the 8th century BC to the fall of the empire in 612, that the Assyrians fought 108 wars of reprisal and reconquest in order to maintain the borders of their empire. The empire exhausted itself militarily and in 612 BC fell to a coalition of Medes and Babylonians. Now, the fall of the Assyrian Empire in many ways set the stage for Cyrus's rise to power. The Near East was now divided between four great states. You have the Median Empire, shown here in yellow, which dominated parts of the Iranian plateau in eastern Anatolia. Median rule probably did not extend as far east as shown in this map. You had the Babylonian Empire, which ruled over Mesopotamia, parts of the Levant, Syria, and also areas in the Arabian Peninsula. You had the Kingdom of Lydia in Western Asia Minor, and then you had Egypt, which was of course the land of the pharaohs. And within a little more than 80 years after Assyria's collapse, each of these great states would in turn be conquered by the Persians. The most important of the successor states to the Assyrian Empire, for our purposes, is the Median Empire. Now, not much is known about this state. In fact, some scholars doubt and dispute whether the Median, the Medes could really be said to have owned an empire or managed an empire in the true sense of the word, insofar as there are no records, no written records at all from the Medes that have survived. But because of that, it probably makes more sense to characterize the Median state, at least in the course of its early history, as a vast tribal confederation that was held together by dynastic alliances that ran between the Median chieftains of the Median royal house and the vassal kings of the outlying territories. The most famous dynastic alliance of which we know is the one whereby Mandana, who is the daughter of Astyagis, the last king of the Medes, was reputedly given in marriage to Candices I, who was the vassal king of Persia. And the offspring of this marriage was, of course, Cyrus II, or Cyrus the Great, who is the subject of our talk. Now, the early Cyrus's birth and origins, his early life, it's all shrouded in myth. The most popular legend, or the best known one, I should say, was the one that can be reconstructed from Herodotus' histories. And according to this tale, Astyagus, the last king of the Medes, had a nightmare in which he saw that his unborn grandson would one day overthrow him from power. So, when the infant Cyrus was born, he gave orders to have the child abandoned in the wilderness. Of course, Cyrus was not eaten by wild animals, nor did he starve, but he was rescued by a wild dog, which saved him from other predators and gave him milk. And then, in due course of time, he was discovered by a cowherd who raised him as a humble commoner, and then eventually, through a miraculous set of circumstances, his true identity was revealed and he was restored to his biological parents. This tale is, of course, pure folklore. It has very close parallels in Indian and Roman mythology. It is particularly opposite to the story of Romulus. Romulus was the eponymous founder of the city of Rome, like Cyrus, he is said to have been abandoned in the wilderness as an infant and to have been raised by a wild dog. Now, all these stories go back to a common Indo-European heritage, and it is my belief that the Achaemenid kings, beginning with Cyrus, circulated these quasi-legendary stories of their upbringing as propaganda, and the idea was to draw parallels between themselves and the great heroes of the Iranian epics whose tales were known to all the Iranian subjects. And there is very indirect evidence, I should say, I think, in this artifact here. This is an amulet from the Parthian or Sasanian period, and it shows the hero Thraetona. This is the Feridun of the Shah Naamen, who is famous for defeating the dragon king Zahat, or Ashdahat, as his name was pronounced in antiquity. Now, there have been noted, there are very stark parallels between the legend of Feridun and Zahat in the Shah Naamen and other sources and Herodotus' legend of Cyrus' overthrow of 
as the audience. And I think it is more than a bit interesting that on the reverse of this amulet, you see here the motif of the canine suckling the infant. Now, this story, although, as I said, it's pure folklore, it's really a pivot point, I thought, in the narrative that I was writing, because you have to, you have to, it still talks about Cyrus's ancestry, and I think if you could get his ancestry right, then a lot of other things in the story are going to fall into place. And it, it appeared to me that the kernel of truth in this story is that Cyrus was, in fact, a half median prince, that this was not just a literary motif. And I subscribe to the theory of Ion Diakonov and other scholars that Cyrus, his fallout, his eventual fallout with the Median king may have been spawned over a succession dispute. And disputes of this kind have been known to occur time and again in Iranian history. Whatever the case, in 559 BC, Cyrus became the vassal king of Persia. He immediately began building up his base of power in southern Iran. He unified the Persian tribes, perhaps extended his ancestral holdings into Kerman and maybe even Khuzestan. And then he raised the standard of revolt in 553 against his Median grandfather, against Astyagus. The war between the Medes and the Persians lasted for three years and ended in a total Persian victory. What is interesting and is mentioned by both the Greek and the cuneiform sources, is that Cyrus received during the course of this war the support of a large faction of the Median aristocracy. And his final victory over the Medes occurred when the Median nobles mutinied against Astyagus in the heart of Persian territory, no less, and handed him to Cyrus in chains. This was an important moment in Cyrus's career and uh, also the history of the Iranian Plateau. Cyrus, I think, learned very important lessons here that he would, uh, he would implement in his later conquests. The Median nobles had obviously supported him because they expected Cyrus to uphold their interests after his victory. And so Cyrus learned very early on in his career that he had to rule on terms and that it behooved him to earn the goodwill of the local elites and the lands that he took over. Cyrus also, according to the classical sources, spared the life of Astyagus, which one accepts the fact that one accepts the notion that Astyagus was his maternal grandfather is quite natural, and he may have learned there that you can also win goodwill by sparing your enemies. Now, the Persian victory reconfigured the relationship between the two most important Iranian peoples of that time. Previously, the Medes had been dominant, but now it was the Persians. And it can be said that this new reconfigured relationship created conditions that were conducive eventually to the development of the idea of Iran as a nation. And you may find evidence of that in this artifact here, this image here. This is actually a photograph of a bas relief from Persepolis, the ceremonial capital of Cyrus's successors. And it depicts a procession of Persian and Median nobles. You see, the Persians are the ones with the fluted caps and the long flowing robes. The Medes wear tunics, they have overcoats over them, and they have domed caps. And you see here the two leading Iranian peoples are grasping hands, the aristocracies of them are grasping hands in a show of unity. Now, the Persian victory over the Medes upset the balance of power in the Near East. King Croesus of Lydia was, according to the tradition, uh, told by Herodotus, he was a brother-in-law of the Median king, so there may have been a dynastic alliance going in that direction as well. But even if one does not accept that uh, testimony, there can be no doubt that the Lydians had long-standing territorial ambitions in eastern Anatolia. There had been a brutal five-year war between the Medes and the Lydians at the time that Cyrus was an infant, and Croesus took advantage of Astyagus' overthrow to renew his claims to Eastern Anatolia. This was an area that the Medes had previously exerted a measure of domination over, and so Cyrus, as the new king of the Medes, uh, laid claim to it. King Croesus crossed the Halas River in 545 BC, and he besieged and sacked the Cappadocian fortress of Teria. Cyrus rode up to meet him, defeated him in battle, and then chased him to the Lydian capital of Sardis with such speed that, according to Herodotus, he was his own messenger. Sardis was reputed to be impregnable, but the Persians took it, they say, after a brief siege of 14 days. What happened to Croesus at this juncture is not entirely clear. Uh, some scholars are of the opinion that he, attempted, that he committed suicide because he felt that 
uh, to kill himself would be a more honorable death than to fall captive to the Persians. And this uh, image here, this is a 5th century BC vase painting by the ancient artist Mysan, shows King Croesus enthroned atop a fire. He's pouring out a libation or some sort of ignitable fluid and oil on the structure, which is about to be set ablaze by one of his servants. However, the classical sources are unanimous in that Croesus' life was spared. And Herodotus tells us that Cyrus pulled him down from the pile, forgave him, and made him a trusted advisor. And Catasius, another historian, tells us that Cyrus gave Croesus an estate in the area of Paris, which may be modern day Guilan, in what is the Median province. Whatever the case, Cyrus would not be as forgiving of the Asiatic Greeks. At that time, the western coast of what is today Turkey had been colonized by Greeks from mainland Europe. These were the Ionians and Aeolians. And these Greeks had been previously subject to the Lydians. During the early stages of his war against Croesus, Cyrus had sent ambassadors to the Greek cities of Asia Minor, seeking from them the same favorable terms of submission. Oh, sorry, actually, sorry. Cyrus had sent ambassadors to them. He was trying to, what he was trying to do was to get them to rise up in rebellion against the Lydians. The Greeks rejected this proposal because they expected that Cyrus would lose in the war. However, once Cyrus was firmly situated in Sardis, the Lydian capital, they then sent ambassadors to him, seeking from him the terms of submission that they had previously received from Croesus. Cyrus was indignant, and if we were to trust Herodotus, he responded by recounting a Greek fable that he may have just heard. This fable, the story that Cyrus recounted, was this. He said that there was once a fisherman who wanted to see the fish in the sea dance. So day after day, he would come and he would play his flute, hoping to see the fish jump out of the water. When at length the fish didn't jump out of the water, the fisherman lost his patience, grabbed the net, threw it in the water, dragged the fish up shore, and then when they were flopping on the beach, he yelled at them and said, See, you would not dance for me when I played my tune, but you're dancing for me now. And the moral of the story is that Cyrus would conquer the Greeks by force. This again is just a fable, but it shows that Cyrus, like any good Iranian, was capable of holding a grudge. <laughs> So during the five-year period from 545 to 540 BC, Cyrus unleashed his generals against the Greek colonies of Asia. With the exception of the city of Miletus, which had wisely decided to sit out the war between the Persians and Lydians, Cyrus took all these cities by force. He himself did not participate in these wars because while his generals were engaged in the west, he himself was busy in the north and the east. Cyrus marched further in these directions than any Median or Assyrian king before him. We unfortunately do not know the route that his army took, but we know the end product of his campaigns, which was the extension of Persian rule as far afield as western India and the Jaxartes or Syrian River in west central Asia. Cyrus expended a great deal of effort bringing these lands under Persian control, and these conquests, they doubled the territorial extent and perhaps the population of the Persian Empire, but based on the very limited uh, data we have as to the tax income from these provinces, we know that they did not lead to a commensurate doubling of its wealth. So we may ask why it was that Cyrus undertook these eastern campaigns with such determination. One reason was clearly geopolitical. The northeastern frontier of the Iranian plateau has always been exposed to large-scale nomadic invasions from Central Asia. One need only think about the, the invasions of the Turks and Mongols in medieval times. And Cyrus, about 150 years after he came to power, I should say, nomadic tribes known in the Shah I mean, the Iranian epics as the Turanians, but their names are preserved in other records as the Sakas and Sapiens, had ridden across this barrier and they had ransacked agricultural settlements in Media and in Anatolia. They went almost to the Aegean Sea, and if we were to believe Herodotus, they went all the way to the frontiers of Egypt. This was a very traumatic episode in the early history of Iran, and Cyrus seems to have been very much determined to prevent this catastrophe from recurring. So what he did was he built a series of seven frontier fortresses at or near such strategic and important cities as Ghazni, Samarkand, and Tashkent to serve as a bulwark against future nomadic invasions from the steppe. But Cyrus may have been lured to the east, I think, by something else as well. 
there is a reference made in the Young Avesta, this is the portion of the Zoroastrian scriptures that are believed to postdate the prophet of Zoroaster. Reference is made there to a legendary hero called Kadi Osrada. This is Kev Osro in the Shah Muhammad, for those who are familiar with Kev's work. In the Avesta, the Young translation one follows, Kadi Osrada is hailed as the gallant hero who united the Iranian lands into a single kingdom. Now there's a bit of a chicken and an egg problem here. The legends of Kedif Osro, as known from the Avesta, from the Pahlavi scriptures, from the Shah Ramayya, contain many parallels to the so-called Cyrus sagas. And so I think there are one of two things that are possible. If Cyrus had come earlier in time, and I should say first and foremost, the date of Zoroaster is one of the great unsettled issues in Iranian history, and it's been said that the favorite pastime of Iranists is to debate when the prophet lived. <laughs> but if Cyrus came first in time, it is possible that the memories of his eastern conquests and his motivations for these conquests were preserved in the legend of Kadi Osarad or Kefosro. If, on the other hand, Kadi Osarad or Kefosro was the first in time, one might think that Cyrus pursued his eastern conquest in part to attain the legendary ideal of unification of the Iranian tribes, said to have been attained by this king, much in the same way as Alexander the Great, for example, when he was invading the Persian Empire two centuries later, thought that he was reenacting the heroic deeds of Achilles. In any event, by 540 BC, Cyrus had completed his eastern conquest and he set his sights on Babylon. Babylon was at that time the wealthiest and the strongest city in the Near East. It had the greatest fortifications. It had a very lengthy history going back already 2000s of years as a true center of civilization. But it was also a city that was mired in strife. Nabonidus, the last ruler of the Babylonian Empire, was not a native Babylonian, rather he was an Aramean from northern Mesopotamia. As such, he was not particularly devoted to the cult of Marduk. This is an image of Marduk. Marduk was the chief god traditionally of the Babylonian pantheon, and the principal divinity believed to look after the welfare of Babylon the city, which was the capital of that empire. Rather, Nabonidus was devoted to the cult of the moon god, Sin, who was also the patron divinity of his own hometown, which was Haram. If we go over the sources, it would seem that Nabonidus was planning at this time an unpopular reform of the Babylonian religion, in which he sought to subvert the cult of Marduk and to replace Marduk atop the pantheon with Sin. This antagonized the Marduk priesthood. This was a very powerful clergy with extensive land holdings and wealth. This is an archaeologist reconstruction of one of the temples that they controlled. This is the temple of Etamaranki, the Tower of Babel of biblical fame. And it is said, it seems very possible, I should say, based on the sources, that the Marduk priests colluded with Cyrus in advance of his final invasion of Mesopotamia in 539 BC. They disseminated pro-Persian propaganda in Cyrus as the chosen prince of Marduk, as an upholder of traditional Babylonian religious values, and in this way they paved the path for the Persian invasion. There was only one battle of which we know, and we don't know exactly what happened there, but it is interesting that after that conflict, all the great cities of Babylon opened their gates to the Persians one by one. And so Babylon itself the strongest, most heavily fortified city in the Near East fell to the Persians without a battle in 539 BC. When Cyrus entered Babylon, he did so in the manner of a native king. It is said that the people rejoiced at his entrance, that they laid green twigs before his chariot, and that they celebrated him as a native king, and that Cyrus, in turn, paid homage to the god Marduk, and that he said, forbade the soldiers from exposing their weapons as they marched. It was a procession of peace. Now we know this from various texts. One of them is the Cyrus Cylinder here. This is a propagandistic document, so we have to take the account with a grain of salt. At the time of the last Shah of Iran, Muhammad Reza Pahlavi, uh, the Shah's propagandists hailed this as the first charter of human rights. Uh, I think they went very far overboard because the concept of human rights as we know it did not exist at that time. However, what I think that the Cyrus Cylinder stands for 
is it shows a foreign conqueror coming into a hallowed center of civilization, subduing himself to native traditions and going out of his way to present himself as a native king. And that is very noteworthy. And that is why I do not subscribe to the theories of certain recent scholars who actually try to categorize this as just in another, another in a long list of building texts in the Mesopotamian tradition. The Cyrus Wonder is also noteworthy, I think, because it talks about an important restoration project that appears to have been undertaken or initiated, I should say, almost immediately after the Persian conquest of Babylon. The Babylonians, like the Assyrians before them, practice population deportation and god mapping in order to maintain their rule. And in the Cyrus Cylinder, reference is made to the Persian king giving orders to repatriate all the exiled populations and to send back with them all the confiscated cult icons to the lands to the north and to the east of Babylon as far as Susa and Ashur in the Assyrian heartland. No mention is made in the Cyrus Cylinder of similar restoration work being undertaken in the provinces to the west of Babylon, but we know from other sources that this happened. We have documents from Nehrat, near the Syrian settlement of Aleppo, which seem to indicate that there was a restoration of peoples and cult icons to that region, and then there's, of course, the famous case of the Jews. In 586 BC, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar II had sacked the city of Jerusalem and he burnt to the ground the temple of Yahweh, the Jewish God that King Solomon had built several centuries before, and he marched into Babylonian captivity or exile, perhaps as many as 20,000 Jews. During the lead up to his invasion of Babylon, Cyrus established contacts with the leaders of this Jewish population that was living in exile. The anonymous prophet, known as Second Isaiah, hailed Cyrus in his compositions as the Lord's anointed and as the shepherd of Yahweh. They said that if the Persian conqueror were to ca capture Babylon, he would repatriate the Jews, he would send them back, and he would rebuild the temple. And we have in the books of Ezra and Second Chronicles, we have memoranda of an edict that Cyrus uh, seems to have issued in the name of Yahweh, the Jewish God, authorizing the return of the exiles and the expenditure of royal funds to rebuild the temple. Now, it is important to note that with all kings, there tends to be sometimes a disparity between what they seek to do and what actually happens, and the reconstruction of the temple in Jerusalem may be one of these examples. I do not doubt that Cyrus issued the edict. I think this has been demonstrated in scholarly literature, although there are doubters. But at the same time, it, needs, it requires mention that the actual reconstruction of the temple was not completed until the sixth year of the reign of Darius I in 516 BC. So there were many interruptions in the work. And to an extent, this is natural if you consider that the Persians had just taken over a kingdom and they had to figure out the management and everything. There was a great deal of planning that was involved. In any event, having repatriated the exiles, having conquered Babylon, Cyrus dedicated the last decade of his reign to organizing his empire and establishing kingly ideology. Now, the great administrator among the Achaemenid kings was, of course, Darius I, who in certain respects refounded the Persian Empire. But I think that some of the, much of the groundwork for what Darius did was already laid at the time of Cyrus. The Persian king was an absolute monarch. As a result, a great deal of pomp and ceremony surrounded his person. And in this image here, you see the Persian king shown in full regalia. This is a famous artifact from Persepolis. It depicts the king Xerxes, Cyrus's grandson, seated on a throne. The throne would have been gilded, his scepter, the royal scepter would have been of gold, as would have been the crown that sat on the king's head. His robes would have been dyed purple, which was the most expensive dye in antiquity. And in his left hand, he grasps a lotus flower, which is the symbol of immortality. And he has, of course, the telltale sign of an ancient Near Eastern ruler, which is the long flowing curled beard, which would have been, which would have been perfume as well. And the only other person in the empire who could don these attributes was the crown prince, who is shown here behind the throne, but in actuality, the scene, he would have probably been standing to his right. And in fact, it has been said that in the Bible, the reference is made to the Son of Man, to the Savior, standing at the right hand of the throne of glory and the throne of power that would be the right hand of the throne of God. 
This was all based on actual scenes that were seen playing out at the Persian court. In any event, it bespeaks the centrality of the king in the imperial ethos that you see here that the seated king is the same size as his standing son and successor. And in fact, if you were to pan out, you'd see that both the king and the crown prince are almost twice as large as the other figures portrayed in this scene. Now, the Persian king was a divine right monarch. He received his mandate to rule directly from heaven, and as such, he was an intermediary between gods and men. This aspect of the royal ideology is demonstrated and exhibited in numerous artifacts. I think the one scene that really captures it the best is this here. This is a photograph of one of the facades of the tombs of Cyrus's successors at Naqshirostan, near Persepolis. And it shows the Persian king here standing atop a three-tiered dais or platform, and he is praying before a fire altar in the age-old Zoroastrian fashion. Now, I know there was a great deal of debate among scholars as to what the religion of the Achaemenid kings was. Suffice it to say that it is my theory or my belief that all the emperors, from Cyrus the Great to Darius the Third, practiced one form or another of Zoroastrianism. But that Cyrus's beliefs may have differed from those of, say, Darius or Xerxes, in that he was also devoted to the god Mithra, and this may have had to do with Cyrus's median beings and affinities. In any event, there's the king, there's the fire altar. This is the symbol of Ahura Mazda, the chief god of the Zoroastrian faith. He is emanating from a winged solar disk and he is extending a ring, which symbolizes sovereignty to the king. Now, this entire ensemble of dais and uh, fire altar, it rests on a platform. This was called in Old Persian the Gothu. And it is being supported by representatives of the different subject nations, including the Persians were shown here on an equal footing with the empire's different subject. And what I think this scene stands for is that the king prays to the god on behalf of the people, and the people, in return, uphold the monarchy. And this was the center of the sacral aspect, I should say, of the academic kingship. Now, there were many different gods, many different religions in the Persian Empire, which was unprecedented in its cultural and religious diversity. And the Achaemenid emperors, beginning with Cyrus, made it a practice to communicate to each subject nation in terms of its own religion. We've already touched upon that with Cyrus, in as much as his Cyrus cylinder inscription, in that text, he worships, he puts himself forward as a devotee of the Babylonian god Marduk. In his edict, regarding the repatriation of the Jewish exiles, he presents himself as a worshiper of Yahweh. And this artifact, is, belongs to the reign of Cambyses II, Cyrus's son and heir, the conqueror of Egypt, and we see him here bowing before the Apis bull. This was the sacred bovine of the Egyptians, and Cambyses III appears here garbed as a pharaoh. Now, in terms of its organization, the Persian Empire has been likened to a federalism. You had the king and the high level bureaucracy at the highest levels of government, but different provinces and subject peoples enjoyed local autonomy. This bespeaks both a policy of tolerance, but it was also pragmatic. The Persians were definitely not numerous enough in antiquity to impose their will upon and their way of life upon all their different subjects. Nevertheless, it bears mentioning that despite this, the Persians, as opposed to the Assyrians, there is no indication that they sought to assimilate their subjects to the Persian way of life, even in cases where they could have done so. And this, again, contributed to the relative stability of the Persian Empire. And during the Persian period, we see that there was really a flourishing of local legal traditions. The law at that time had a greater concept of just right and wrong. It was really the embodying of the customs of a nation. The best known example of this is, again, the case of the Jews. In the middle of the 5th century BC, the Persian emperor Artaxerxes I, Cyrus's great-grandson, sent the priest scholar Ezra on mission to Jerusalem to educate the people in the law of Moses. And the end product of Ezra's mission was very likely the canonization of the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. This would be the Pentateuch or the Torah. Now, it is nevertheless, I think, an important lesson of the academic period that in an integrated global society, attractive ideas will nevertheless catch on and be transmitted. At that time, the most important 
philosophical or religious concept to emanate from Iran was the notion of a divine creation. And so it was perhaps no surprise that the creation myths of the various subject nations transformed the bit during the Persian period, almost beginning with the reign of Cyrus. A scholar named Martin Lutchfield West has uh, studied this with respect to early Greek philosophy. Morton Smith, a biblical scholar at Columbia University, has studied it with respect to the Hebrew Bible. Second Isaiah, whom I mentioned earlier as Cyrus's spokesperson among the Jewish population living in Babylonian exile, is also important in the biblical tradition because he was the first Hebrew prophet to speak in unequivocally monotheistic terms, uh, to speak of Yahweh in unequivocally monotheistic terms as the sole creator of the cosmos. And what is interesting is that his praise of Yahweh in this regard is almost exclusively tied in to his praise of Cyrus. Furthermore, the manner in which the phraseology that he uses is very reminiscent of the standard introduction to the old Persian inscriptions of Cyrus's successors, Darius I and Xerxes, who begin many of their major inscriptions with the following article of faith. A great god is Ahura Mazda, who has created this earth, who has created that sky, who has created man, and who has created happiness for man. And we can compare that to just, I'll read just one of these, passage from 2nd Isaiah. This is what, the God, what God the Lord says. He who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to his people and life to those who walk on. And the rest of the passage has to do with the praise of Cyrus. And it is Morton Smith's theory, and I think it is a very intriguing one, that 2nd Isaiah received his inspiration for this novel conception of Yahweh from Persian propaganda that he may have heard, presenting Cyrus as the chosen king of Ahura Mazda, the Zoroastrian god. Uh, every great king deserves a great palace. In the second half of his reign, Cyrus began construction of a palace complex for himself at the site of Pasargad in the Persian homeland. The name Pasargad was not picked by random, it was the name of Cyrus's ancestral tribe. The Achaemenid family belonged to the Pasargad tribe. And the location of the battle, for to trust the Greek sources, was the site where Cyrus achieved his final victory over Astyages, the Median king. This is an archaeologist's reconstruction of one of the uh, palaces at Pasargad. And this is all that remains of it today. Despite the fact that the ruins at Pasargad are very scanty, they are nevertheless important from the standpoint of art history and enlightening in terms of, of telling us, providing some insights into Cyrus's attitude toward state. When the Persians began the construction of this site, they lacked a native tradition of monumental art or architecture. So what they did was they drew upon the expertise of their more seasoned foreign subjects, and they combined all these different elements but from them they produced a distinctively Iranian art form, and the Persian art form, I should say. And this is, in many ways, a recurring theme in Iranian history, as Iranian culture has had to redefine itself time and again due to foreign influence. This, this, this theme is also best demonstrated, I think, among the uh, ruins at Pasargad. Uh, over here, in this image that you see, this is a line drawing of one of the famous sculptures from that site. It's called the Four Wings. Guardian. No one really knows what it represents. Some, according to some scholars, it is a depiction of the god Mithra. Others have categorized it as a depiction of Cyrus's guardian spirit or spiritual double, if you would. The ancient Iranians believe that each individual had a spiritual double. But it is interesting to see that this figure is shown wearing an Elamite robe. The headdress is Egyptian or Phoenician. And the wings are typical of those that one sees in depictions of protective spirits in Assyrian art. And this has been deemed to reflect Cyrus's ecumenical outlook, as well as perhaps a tip of the cap by the Persian king to the more hallowed civilizations of the Near East. Now, Cyrus, this book, I should say, to bring Cyrus to life, what I did was also examine certain cultural institutions to give a sense of what life was like at his time. And for those of you who are Iranians or are familiar with Iranian ways, you'll see that while much has changed over the course of 25 centuries, a great deal also has not. And there may be much that comes across as familiar to you. 
you'll see that even in antiquity, the Iranians were very much enamored with partying and with drinking. And in fact, one of the recurring, uh, one, of the, one of the objects that are types, categories of objects that are frequently found in sites that have ecumenic pieces are tableware. This would be drinking vessels, such as the silver right on shirt here, and also ornate plates. And actually, regarding the Persians' love of alcohol, the Greek historian Herodotus tells a very interesting anecdote. He says that the Persians were prone to discuss important matters when they were drunk, and so they made it a custom that if they ever decided something when they were drunk, they would also recon they would have to reconsider it later, later when they were sober. But they seem also to believe in this concept of in vinos veritas. And so any decision they made when they were sober, they would then have to reconsider when they were drunk. And so you see there's this circle that the, the alcoholic tendency. In any event, the Persians were also very avid gardeners. This is not surprising. Iran was even back then an arid, dry land. It did not have river valleys like Mesopotamia or Egypt. This depiction here is actually a water channel from Hasargad, where Cyrus had his own ornamental garden. Now there was a particularly, there was a, there was a, there was a specific type of garden that was unique to the Iranians at the time that was called the paradise. In fact, the word paradise is a loan word to English from old Iranian, paradeda, meaning a walled, a walled enclosure. And the paradise gardens, they came in different varieties. Some of them were actually quite vast, and they could serve as hunting parks. Others served almost as botanical experimental laboratories because they would try to bring as many different types of species of plant life there as possible. And in fact, it was because of this diversity of plant and animal life that some scholars believe that the paradise gardens reflect important religious concepts at that time. According to these scholars, the ancient Iranians believed that at the end of time, when salvation would come about, that the, all the different diverse forms of plants, animals, and people would be brought together and reunited. And that the paradise gardens of the Achaemenid kings reflected in this sense the great heavenly gardens that awaited the souls of the pious in the afterlife. And it's perhaps for this reason that even to this day, the great gardens in Iran all have heavenly names. And I'll just cite a few examples. There's the Balba Eran in Shinaz, and there's uh, the Hash Behesh, or Eighth Heaven Garden in Esfahan. Now, there's another convention of ancient Iranian gardening that goes back to the time of Cyrus, and that is the fourfold garden, or the Chahar. Oh, I understand that uh, Iran Heritage recently uh, sponsored a talk on this by David Stronach, who excavated Pasar God. Suffice to say, at present, that the earliest known example of a fourfold garden or Chahar above is the one that Cyrus used as the centerpiece of his palace complex at Pasar God. Now, Cyrus was not destined to die peacefully. He was a warrior, he was a soldier, and in the last years of his reign, there appeared to have been disturbances along the northeastern frontier of his empire. Here, the steppe nomads were a perpetual concern, and in 530 BC, Cyrus went out to meet them in battle. He suffered a wound from which he died. I should say that the stories regarding Cyrus' death are almost as equally shrouded in legend as the stories regarding his birth, and there appears to have been, and I wrote a paper about this, uh, which uh, Mr. Satterick alluded to with the Harvard uh, Athletic Society, uh, we try to reconstruct one of the lost accounts of his death, and this lost account, which we've come up with based on parallels to the legend of Romulus and also of Kefo Sro, Cyrus is said to have gone into occultation to have merged with the spirit of Mithra. In any event, this is obviously folklore again. Uh, his body was laid to rest in this elegant mausoleum which he built for himself at Pasargan. This structure combines elements of Western Anatolian, Urartian, and perhaps even Elamite architecture. There is no trace of an inscription on the tomb, but the classical authors tell us that there was some sort of writing either on it or nearby. There are many uh, different uh, this is variations of what the text read like. The most flowery description is the one given by Plutarch, according to whom the inscription stated, O man, whosoever you are, and from wheresoever you come, for I know that you will arrive to pay homage. Know that I am Cyrus, who bestowed empire upon the Persians. Grudge me not, therefore, this modest monument that covers my body. Thank you very much for your attention. I think this is a good time.
might have been agreed to answer a couple of questions if, um, if there are any. Yes. How was Cyrus or Kush's name pronounced in the Asian version? Yeah, no, no, honestly, no one really knows this. Um, there have been different theories. Um, according to Wilhelm Eilers, it was actually pronounced Korush, which gives rise to Koresh in uh, Hebrew. Uh, Herzfeld, for example, is very adamant that it was pronounced Kurosh as we do in Farsi right now. And that for this reason, it was transcribed as Kurash in Mesopotamia, in the Babylonian and Assyrian. Uh, but it's interesting, I should say this, uh, there is a, a, this issue of the pronunciation and the etymology of his name, uh, which hasn't been settled, according to those who favor an Iranian background, they believe that it's related to the word Kor, which means a young child, like Kor, uh, stuff like that. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's been the subject of a debate as to what his ethnicity was. There are some scholars who believe that the name is originally Elamite, and that therefore Cyrus was not an Iranian at all. He was actually an Elamite king. I think this is a little bit of an overblown argument. But uh, anyways, that's the best I can offer there. Yes? Like all empires, uh, you know, these things are great empires, monarchies are great when you have a very excellent person, a very far-sighted visionary who's willing to collaborate at the helm, but then later as the institutions really take hold and the king becomes more a slave to the institutions than a free thinker, he's concerned about losing his power more than doing good, these empires unravel, and that's what happened with the Persian Empire. They had, after a few generations, they had kings that were extremely luxury-loving, that were opulent, and we see this time and again in Iranian history. Um, it, and, you know, there was mismanagement. But there was also something to be said about the fact that they did not keep up to date with military tactics and technology, and they were outclassed in this respect by the Macedonians when Alexander did. Yes, I, I have a question. Fanatic Cyrus follower. And, uh, uh, they asked Cyrus to, uh, to announce that uh, the region of Persian Empire is uh, Bezoistria, or mm -hmm. far west of Egypt. But the Cyrus uh, uh, denied, uh, said that I would not announce my religion to be the religion of the state or the empire. Because in that case, people will be forced to uh, practice my religion, and I want to have people be free and practice whatever God they want. Is that true? Is there any document? No, there's no documentation to support that. Unfortunately, one of the things is that Cyrus, his, his perception in Iran has been greatly politicized. And there have been many fraudulent, uh, there have been many fraudulent translations of the Cyrus Cylinder that have been issued. In fact, there's a really bad one that came out a few years ago where Cyrus was proclaimed to have been a sponsor of entrepreneurship, and unfortunately, there was an Iranian fellow who won an award in Silicon Valley who quoted that uh, translation of the Cyrus Cylinder, which obviously also highlights the dangers of uh, following blindly information you find online. So, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's a problem, but no, it, it, you have to keep in mind, at that time, there was the, the combination of church and state, if you would, was intrinsic to all these empires. And we just don't have that much material about Cyrus. What we have, in the way of his own proclamations, were all in non-Iranian languages, he was first and foremost a good politician. He cannot be expected to talk, for example, about his devotion to any one god or another in those texts, any one Iranian god, I should say. I think there's one more question. You've talked about the lack of historical documentation. Um, how widespread, how unusual was that at the time, uh, as far as Cyrus is concerned? And what percentage would you say what you've written about um, is, is based on actual historical fact. I mean, it's in some ways a bit of a tragedy that we have to rely so much on the prerogatives. Right. It, it, I, I would definitely agree with you, but you can't 
pick, unfortunately you can't really pick your sources in terms of what's available. You can pick, you can exercise judgment in how much you're going to rely on that. There's, there's very little. You could probably take, and John, correct me if I'm wrong, you could probably take all the primary source material from the time of Cyrus and condense it to about seven or eight pages. Right, maybe a little bit more if you account for the biblical uh, passages. So there's a lot of guesswork, there's a lot of uh, surmise and speculation that unfortunately has to go into it. But, you know, I try to approach it from a lawyer's perspective, which is that if it doesn't sound patently made up, right, and it's on the record from Herodotus or Cassius said that if it's corroborated by another one of these guys and, it should, and you, there's no conclusive proof that the corroborating source is dependent upon the first one, you have to kind of go with it unless proven, you know, uh, burden of persuasion, you know, burden of persuasion and stuff. I, I have to say that this wonderful book is all based on historical fact. So, <laughs> I, I think now I'd like to call on Bhakti Dada and the chairman of IHF to propose a vote of thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much.